So, welcome to Lou, and he's going to talk on various things. Would you like to explain? I will try to explain. This is the theme. Um, and before I, I start this talk, I want to mention that the Thursday seminar, the quantum topology seminar this week, will occur at 11 o'clock. Um, uh, um, I think that for this list, might be disjoint from my list, some of you. So if you're interested in coming, um send me an email and i will i'll put you on my list um the the seminar will be unusual this week uh vasily got interested hearing me talk about the shadow world uh and so we're going to have a discussion about the shadow world at 11 o'clock on thursday chicago time uh and uh, so we'll see what we can speculate about the shadow world. Can you, um, are you uh, familiar with the shadow world? The well, shadow only only as far as ghosts and yes, yes. I, I, so I should tell you what is the shadow world. You may recall that there is uh, a world of the colored Jones polynomials, and in this world you have knot diagrams plus trivalent vertices and the edges of the knot diagrams are labeled with integers that are positive integers that correspond to irreducible representations of the SL2 quantum group, um, if you like that language, or correspond to multiple parallel lines uh, with certain projectors on them. And Kirillov and Reshetikin devised a, a remarkable way to translate such networks into partition functions that calculate the invariance, the colored Jones polynomial invariance and the Witten invariance by using uh, the regions in the plane for labels as well as the edges of the diagram. Um, so that there are um, tensors for, uh, for example, an edge with two labels on either side of it gets a tensor called theta ABC and so on. And the translation from one place to the other is called the shadow world. Uh, the, the, the diagrams with labels on their regions are called elements of the shadow world. So that's what we're going to be talking about is this translation and some of the problems involved in making such a translation for virtual knots. So that's Thursday. Okay. okay. Well, that sounds really interesting. And this is going to be exactly the same time as now. now uh, yes, the, yeah, yes, the same time as now, if that is not paradoxical. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so this talk is about, well, really, it's about quantum field theory and the Jones polynomial, the famous Witten title. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and what I want to do here is uh, explain uh, how uh, Witten's integral works mechanically with advanced calculus a bit, um, not entirely rigorously, and then how Vasiliev invariants are related to it, and then talk about Vasiliev invariants in the abstract a little bit. And that's this talk. And um, if Roger would allow it, um, I'll give a second talk in which I confront something that I'm meaning to confront, which is that when you do the technique of the perturbative expansion of Witten's integral, you end up with a lot of integral terms, which if you use the right so-called gauge fixing, give rise to the Kuntsevich integrals. But the course of getting to that involves understanding certain correlation functions. And I realized after about a 20 year hiatus that I didn't understand that. So I thought I would try to think about it again by giving a talk or two about it. Maybe by the time I get to the second talk, I will have something more coherent to say about the problem I ran into about the correlation functions. But we won't talk about that today. So anyway, um, as you know, 
the idea that there should be quantum field theory behind the not polynomials simmered for a while, uh, encouraged by Michael Atia, and Ed Witten found a way to do it in the summer of 1988 in Swansea, Wales. And Witten's solution to making a quantum field theory version of the Jones polynomial will come up in a moment, but I need to remind you about a technique from, oh, and this is the paper, which is easily available all over the web. If you were to just uh, uh, just call that up, it will, it will appear. Uh, beautiful paper, which many of you I'm sure have seen before. And I won't bother you with it at the moment, but but, but it uses a generalization of Feynman integrals. And I wanted to say just a couple of words about Feynman integrals before I uh, go back to Witten. So a physical quantity that's very useful in thinking about physics and about quantum mechanics is the, uh, is the Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. This is called the action. Um, and, and it turns out that if you want to get the equations for quantum, for classical mechanics, excuse me, then you can take the integral of L over path from A to B and ask what path will extremize that integral doing variational calculus. This is classical mechanics. And you find certain differential equations for coming from L and you find that you get Newton's laws. That's quite amazing. Um, and that's due to Lagrange in the uh, 19th century. Um, and what Feynman, it's interesting to, to show you Feynman's tale about this. He, uh, he was looking, as he said, this is, uh, from Feynman's Nobel lecture. And he says, uh, it used to be that quantum mechanics was written entirely in terms of the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of kinetic and potential energy. It is the energy. Um, and uh, he was wondering, because he really liked this classical theorem about extremizing the integral, and he tells the tale about how he learned that from his uh, teacher when he was in high school. Um, he would like a Lagrangian version of quantum mechanics somehow. Uh, and he's in graduate school at this time. And, and so he says that um, what he was trying to do didn't help very much. Um, but he went to a beer party at, in the NASA tavern in Princeton. And uh, a gentleman newly arrived from Europe, Herbert Yela, came and sat next to him. Europe, I'll read it from here. Europeans are much more serious than we are in America because they think that a good place to discuss intellectual matters is a beer party. So he sat by me and asked, what are you doing? And I said, I'm drinking beer. And then I realized that he wanted to know what work I was doing. And I told him I was struggling with this problem. And I turned to him and said, listen, do you know any way of doing quantum mechanics starting with action, where the action integral comes into the quantum mechanics? No, he said, but Dirac has a paper in which the Lagrangian comes into quantum mechanics. I'll show it to you. We went to the Princeton Library, and Dirac said, there's a quantum mechanics, an important quantity that carries the wave function from one time to another, <clears throat> besides the differential equation, but equivalent to it, a kernel. And um, Dirac points out that this kernel is analogous to the Lagrangian. Professor Yela showed me this. <coughs> I read it. He explained it to me, and I said, what does he mean they're analogous? What does that mean, analogous? What is the use of that? He said, you Americans, you always want to find a use for everything. I said that I thought that Drac must mean they were equal. No, he re explained, he doesn't mean they're equal. Well, I said, let's see what happens if we make them equal. So I simply put them equal, taking the simplest example where the Lagrangian is one half M x squared minus v of x, but soon found I had put a constant of proportionality in. And when I substituted that 
and wrote down the propagator here and just calculated things out by a Taylor series, out came the Schrodinger equation. So I turned to Professor Yala, not really understanding, and said, well, you see, Professor Dirac meant they were proportional. Professor Yala's eyes were bugging out. He'd taken out a little notebook and was rapidly copying it down from the blackboard. And he said, no, no, this is an important discovery. You Americans are always trying to figure out how something can be used. That's a good way to discover things. So I thought I was finding out what Dirac meant, but as a matter of fact, had made the discovery that what Dirac thought was analogous was in fact equal. I had then at least the connection between the Lagrangian and quantum mechanics still with wave functions and infinitesimal times. Uh, and in these notes, which I won't go over, but I'll send you the notes, is an excerpt from Feynman's thesis that does the calculation that he we just referred to, shows that this integral gadget satisfies Schrodinger's equation. So the, the, the prescription becomes integrate over all paths from A to B, E to the I over H bar S, where S is the integral along a given path of the Lagrangian. You integrate over all paths and each path contributes an E to the I theta for a certain theta that comes from the Lagrangian. And those complex numbers, those phases in, all add up and give you the amplitude, the probability amplitude for getting from one point to the next. Um, and, and it works out, it solves Schrodinger's equation and, and furthermore gives an insight into uh, why classical mechanics should be a limit of quantum mechanics because that theorem of Lagrange that says that classical mechanics extremizes the Lagrangian means that in the neighborhood of paths where the Lagrangian is extremized, all the phases will add up. And so you get a very strong component of the path integral amplitude adding up from the classical paths. And so that shows the relationship between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And that's the story of Feynman's integral, and, and he was talking about it in his Nobel lecture. And in these pages, which I'm not going to go over, you can have some fun looking at how he explained it using elementary calculus. And one of the things that you need very much when you do this is Gaussian integrals, and we have to talk about them eventually, but maybe we don't talk about them today. You need these Gaussian integrals in order to write out what's going on in that integration, even in this case, and then you can show it satisfies Schrodinger's equation. So that's the Feynman path integral. The probability of amplitude for going from state U to state V is the sum over all the phases contributed by all paths from U to V, like that, where the action is the Lagrangian. Um, and this integral presents a lot of problems in terms of its mathematics. If you didn't have the I in there, you would be looking at what people call a Wiener integral and Wiener found measure for such integrals for diffusion processes. And there is a measure theory, but when you put the I in, the measure theory becomes um, um, non-existent or only true for certain very special situations to get a measure theory. And so these integrals are formal integrals and still to this day are formal integrals, even in the standard um, uh, quantum mechanics, much less generalizing them. Now, how do they get generalized? Well, they get generalized as summing over all the fields that can occur. And then it becomes quantum field theory. So if you wanted to quantize the electromagnetic field, then you need to think of all the possible fields in space and you may have to integrate over all the different possible fields to get a quantum amplitude for going from one specific field configuration to another. Uh, and so uh, at that level of ideas, it's a direct generalization of Feynman's integral to get to quantum field theory. Now the notes here also contain some background about Schrodinger's equation in relation to um basic equations about energy and momentum 
and uh, you could have some fun reading my notes, but I'm skipping that too. Uh, I want to make a mention about my attitude about integration, since I have no measure theory in this talk, and in some cases there is no measure theory. I regard integrals in the freshman calculus form. That is, uh, if f minus g is a derivative, and we have and we have vanishing boundary conditions then the integral of f is equal to the integral of g. Okay? So that's how to do integration without any measure theory. And you can do some things. For example, suppose that you wrote a Taylor series for your function. Uh, and then uh, you notice that that says that f of x plus j is f of x plus a derivative. Well, that means that the f of x plus j is equivalent to f of x. And so the integral is... The integral that I would write down, therefore, is translation invariant. Or if you wish to uh, look at the function e to the minus x squared over 2 plus jx, then uh, I could uh, complete the square in there. That's what I just did up there in the exponent. So I have a j squared over 2. And now it's e to the j squared over 2 times e to the x minus j squared over 2. But x but integrals are translation invariant. And so this is equivalent to j squared over 2 e to the minus x squared over 2. And I have that the integral of e to the minus x squared over 2 plus jx is equal to e to the j squared over 2 times the integral of e to the minus x squared over 2. Um, and that is a basic formula about... Um, Gaussian integrals. And if you know the formula for the integral of e to the minus x squared over 2, then you know how to deal with moments that are related to adding the jx. Something we'll come to later in lecture number 2. But um, I'm going to think of all my integrals in this non-integral, non-measure theoretic way. That means that I look at what's behind the integral sign and I'm willing to manipulate it. And if I could write it as a derivative, why then it will go away. So now we start the lecture itself. Here's Witten's integral. Um, what does it look like? It looks like this, that you integrate over all gauge fields. And I have to tell you, what is a gauge field? Remember, this is intended to be intended to be an elementary talk. So I'm trying to tell you what everything means eventually. Um, uh, so A's are gauge fields, and I need to tell you what they are. Um, here's an exponentiated something, and this is like the action, but it's a special one which is designed for this problem uh, of integrating over gauge fields, something that you measure from the knot. So the WK of A is called the Wilson loop, and it is a something that you measure from the knot. What it's going to be is like this, that you um, um, said uh, without the definitions, and I'll say it with the definitions in a moment. You take a particle, a test particle, and you walk it along the knot in the field and find out how it changed when it came back and measure how it changed by taking the trace of a certain linear transformation. And that's called the Wilson loop. Now I'll say it another way, and, and then I'll say it in more detail. A is actually a connection. A is a connection on a fiber bundle over the three manifold. But for our purposes, it's always going to be a trivial fiber bundle, and that you can think of the fiber as some vector space, so that there is some vector uh, associated to a point on the knot. And now when you move from one point on the knot to a nearby point on the knot, you, you are going to take that vector and multiply it by A, which is a matrix valued thing, and add it to the original vector. A is infinitesimal. It's a differential one form. And so V plus AV is an infinitesimal different vector V prime from V. And it is the parallel translation across an infinitesimal bit. You then proceed to do the parallel translation, multiplying by 1 plus A, 
across the entire curve until you come back to where you started. That looks like an infinite product of one plus A's, which is an infinite product in the same way that an integral is an infinite sum. Actually makes sense. Uh, and you get a linear transformation on the internal space from at the point you started, and you take the trace of that, and that is what you measure for the knot. So that's what happens when a particle moves along the knot and comes back to where it started. Um, and, and that's a nice idea and, um, and okay, but it isn't invariant under uh, isotopy of the knot. And this other term involving this Lagrangian balances that out. So that's the way things work. And as I said, A is a one form. And so this form here, A wedge DA plus two thirds A wedge A wedge A is a three form. And that's what this guy is. This guy S is the integral of that three form on the three manifold. So that is what Witten's proposed uh, invariant looks like. It's going to be an invariant of a three manifold in general. Uh, with a knot in it. And it's going to be many invariants depending on what gauge group you chose. And if you choose uh, the SL2 gauge group, it'll turn into the Jones polynomial. So that's a quick summary. And now we need to look at the, uh, the details of this. So it's often the case that what I call WK of A is written this way. The path ordered integral of E, path ordered, uh, I'm sorry, the trace of the path ordered exponentiated integral around K of A. I haven't told you what A is other than it's some matrix valued one form, but that's a lot already. Um, and it is something that you could integrate around A, but you'll th if you think of integrating around A, that means summing A around A. Um, if you sum and you exponentiate, then it becomes a product. And, and um, intuitively, A is, uh, so this is the product over the points on K of E to the A. And A is infinitesimal, so E to the A is one plus A. And that's why it goes back to what I said, multiplying one plus A again and again and again, all the way around the knot. Now, of course, if you go into the further detail and see what it looks like, it looks like this, but I think I don't need it. Uh, we'll skip that slide. But here's what A looks like nuts and bolts so, I so told Lou, you, when you were describing the integral you you really meant to take the trace of a da yeah plus. sometimes i forget to write the trace did i forget to write it in that well, slide when you were talking about it but you put it in this one but when you were talking about it you were it was a you know it was a matrix quantity yeah um when when i was over here talking i said um but uh, but i was talking and i didn't write a lot down I said WK of A is the trace of this um, result of applying the connection all the way around, doing parallel translation all the way around the knot and bringing it back to the beginning. That's a linear transformation. Parallel translate around the knot and find out what happened to your vector and then take the trace of that transformation. I was talking about S of MA. Oh, S of MA is an integral over the three manifold of the turn simons form. But as you've written it right now, it's a matrix valued form. And I think you need to take well, the Excuse me. Um, I don't think anything is wrongly written, but it could be. S of MA is the integral over M of the trace, trace. of the turn simons form. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Maybe I forgot to say trace while I was talking. Yes. Right. So you can, the, it's a three form and you can integrate it uh, over the manifold, but you can integrate the trace of it to get a number. And it's the number that we're after. So what we want to see is how the mechanics of this is working. Um, and so in order to think about the mechanics of it, 
I need to write down uh, a, a putatively explicit form for A of X. And this is the putatively explicit form. T upper A is a bit, the set of T upper A's, say A running from one to D, is uh, a basis for a matrix representation of a Lie algebra. So for example, it could be the Pauli matrices. Um, a, runs, a runs across the number of elements in the basis of the Lie algebra. K runs from one to three. And A uppercase of A of X is a function of X, the space point. So for each K and each A, A uppercase of A is a smooth function of points in space. So, so that's the gauge field or the gauge connection. It's a Lie algebra value, one form on three space. Now, I, I like another notation for the Wilson loop, the trace of the, of the holonomy. And that is bracket Ka. Sometimes I use that. Now I'm going to use this little box with an upper uh, with an upper uh, edge and an arrow going through it to represent the linear transformation T upper A. So T upper A could be applied to a vector on the left and will become the vector that is, it is applied to, and the A is the index. With that notation, I can think of, um, of A as um, in some composition. So you can think of it as a categorical arrow where, well, never mind. I don't want to try to define a category here. The Wilson loop is the trace of the path-ordered exponential. And then here's a case where I did forget to write trace. Um, this should have trace written right there, okay? Maybe when I fix this slide, I'll, I'll fix it. But this is the product over the points on the knot of one plus A. A is written out, but it's just one plus A. And you take the product. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you could do it by a Riemann integral kind of notion. Partition the knot into a, a collection of points and take the product in that order of these matrices and take the limit as the partition gets finer. Uh, and that's the Wilson loop. And you're supposed to take the trace of that. And that's that represents parallel translation around the knot until you come back. Um, now, another thing that is useful is being able to insert a matrix into the line. So I could put a matrix TA right there in this particular point on the line. And that means that if I now, uh, if I now write TAW with that insertion or W sub and then indicate the insertion, it means that you took this product, but when you got to that point, you took that matrix as well in the product. So um, the, it depends on the order and you put it in like that. Um, so, uh, we've said everything, and I also wish to differentiate. Now, I wish to differentiate with respect to A upper A sub K of X. Thinking of A upper A sub K of X altogether for a given X, a given A, and a given K as a variable. In order to do that, you need uh, distributions. You need direct delta functions. Uh, I will write everything as though I could just regard it as a variable. Um, you can add the extra rigor for that um, to your heart's content. So that means that if I want to differentiate this product with respect to this specific variable, A upper A sub K at X for a given X, in the product, this one variable will be knocked out and you'll be left with TA DXI in that position in the product. Okay, formally differentiating, gauge differential. Um, and I'm indicating that by a D upper A sub K like that. So taking the D upper A sub K of the Wilson loop means that you inserted into the Wilson loop a TA and a little dxk 
at a specific point. Of course, the DXK is a scalar, uh, commuting scalar, and can be put anywhere you like. Um, the matrix needs to be in the loop at a specific point. We need to differentiate later, so that's what the diagrammatics for the differentiation looks like. And this differentiation, this gauge differentiation, also picks up information from the chern simons lagrangian so chern simons lagrangian is that integral that we talked about before of the chern simons form its trace and if you differentiate that you get the curvature tensor for the uh connection that we just talked about i'll say more about it in a moment but you get it with the indices in the wrong place and you need to rewrite the indices by tying in an epsilon Epsilon is a nice matrix which is related to three by three determinants and volumes. It is epsilon one, two, three is one. Epsilon one, three, two is minus one. Epsilon, if any indices are repeated, is zero. So it's just a sign of the permutation i, j, k. Okay? Um, and so you see that if you tied it into an index, it would give you two other indices that are complementary to them. If you tied it into a one, it would give you two and three and so on. So, um, so it turns out that if you differentiate the Wilson, if you differentiate the Lagrangian, you get the curvature. How else do you get the curvature? Well, by parallel translating around a small circle, you get the curvature. And that's why we need this because you see, think about it. If you, if you're, forming the Wilson loop for the knot, and you pushed a little bit, then the difference between the knot that you had and the one that you isotoped a little bit locally is a little circular turn, just a little turn. Um, and uh, so that will change the Wilson loop by a curvature calculation. And so it will be varying in relation to curvature, the Wilson loop. But this Lagrangian also varies in relation to curvature, where the varying is the way the field varies. So the field variation gives curvature from the Lagrangian, and the space variation gives curvature from the Wilson loop. And in Witten's integral, they balance each other out. I don't think I need the wonderful identity about the epsilon. <laughs> I just like it. And there's a nice identity about the epsilon. Um, here's the curvature. The curvature is, in fact, given by dA plus A red J. You may know that if you already studied differential geometry. Um, I'll, I'll make a remark about why that's true in a moment, but you will notice that the chern simons lagrangian is clearly related to the curvature. It looks sort of like you multiplied it by A, but there's this funny two-thirds in it. And that that uh, surface indication is is uh, is actually a reflection of the fact that if you differentiate L with respect to A, you do get the curvature back out of it. Curvature, as I said, is obtained by parallel translating around a small piece. So here in these notes is a uh, parallel translate or uh, along this side of the rectangle or parallel translate along that side of the rectangle and look at what happens. And parallel translation is multiplication by one plus A. And I'm not going to do this, but you could do it. I mean, it's done here, but you don't want to walk, you don't want me to drag you through the algebra. But when you take the difference, you find out that you get the derivative with respect to uh, xi of aj minus the derivative j with respect to, of ai and the commutator of ai and aj since they don't commute with one another and you have products ai aj in one order and aj ai in the other order and this is the fij <clears throat> this is the curvature tensor and the dxi dxj is an area so it's just like Riemannian geometry where when you find the curvatures you get it multiplied by an area um, and, um, and that is exactly what happens when you do dA plus A with J, because in differential forms, you have the non-commuting dxi, dxj is minus dxj, dxi, and those differences come in just formally out of differentiating the form. So the form doesn't know anything about 
going around little loops. It just automatically produces the right formula for you by some miracle of algebra. And, um, and so there's the curvature tensor. And oh, and then physics. The curvature tensor turns out to be the field. And, and it was really, it was Hermann Weyl who first discovered that for the electromagnetic field. And then Yang and Mills generalized it to connections like the ones we're talking about. And they, they were surprised to understand, Yang and Mills, I mean, were surprised to understand that it had to do with differential geometry um, because they invented it by generalizing the physics related to the field. They were happy to learn that. You know, there are nice articles by C.N. Yang about the relationship between math and physics along those lines. Um, there's a little lore, or extra lore about the churn simons form in here that I'll skip. But this is what that formula looks like if you wrote it. Uh, the epsilon tied into the K, uh, the derivative of the, of the churn simons Lagrangian with respect to the gauge field equals the, for the, the uh, curvature tensor. And you'll notice I have an A here. That's because the curvature tensor that I wrote had Lie algebra in it. And this is just the numerical coefficient for a given basis element TA. So that we have that. And then we have the other thing. And the other thing is that if you varied the loop a little bit, then you could think of varying it by a little bloop like that, that would, of course, be the same as parallel translating around a small loop. And so you can verify that the result of this difference is to take a Wilson loop with an insertion of the Lie algebra, you're summing over all the A's, the curvature tensor F upper A, lower IJ, DXI, DXJ. So curvature is inserted into the Wilson loop if you vary it geometrically. So we're now in a position to think about what happens. If you vary it geometrically, you insert curvature into the Wilson loop. If you differentiate it, you get a, a Lie algebra insertion, and this represents a dx. So we can put this all together and find out how the Witten integral behaves when you vary the loop. <laughs> so that's what this is meant to be. Here's the varying of the loop. And we, as we said, the varying of the loop causes a curvature insertion into the Wilson line. The Wilson line calculates like it did before, but when it hits that point where the, where the loop had been uh, pushed a little bit, you get a curvature tensor in there and a little bit of area form like that. But this is the derivative of something, this product here, this scalar here. This is a derivative of L. So we can write it as the derivative of L and the epsilon appeared. But the derivative of L could be obtained by differentiating the E to the KL. So we could write it this way. Now it's the derivative of the E to the KL. And now we're going to integrate by parts. That is, I took the derivative of this part, E to the KL, and I put the derivative back over onto the Wilson loop. Change sign. And we're assuming that when you made this change from this function to this function, d of f times g versus f times d of g, and change the sign, the integral doesn't change because the sum of dfg and fdg is a derivative. And so they have the same integral, remember? Um, so these integrals are equal. The integral that I'm using is okay mathematically, but is only an equivalence class of what's being integrated, right? We don't know how to actually integrate, but we would hope to find out in the course of our travels. 
So now we're differentiating the Wilson loop again. So we differentiate it. What happens when you differentiate the Wilson loop is you insert Lie algebra into the Wilson loop and a dx. Well, if you follow the indices, you find that the dx connects directly to the epsilon. And the upper part, which was an A, is a Lie algebra index and connects to a Lie algebra index. But it's connected to this other Lie algebra and so you index. So you find that two Lie algebra elements are inserted into the Wilson loop and you're summing over them. And there's a dx here, which we can just slide over. It's a scalar. And we have here a volume form, dxi, which dxj, which dxk, and a double insertion of Lie algebra into the Wilson loop. So that says, morally speaking, that if the deformation of the curve generated some volume, then there would be a change in the integral. But if the deformation of the curve did not generate any volume, like a flat Reitermeister move two or three, then the integral will not change. It's saying that ZK is a framed invariant. The third, first Reitermeister move will cause something to happen, and the other two will not. A framed invariant. And of course, this, this tinkering way of thinking about it is completely different from Witten's paper, mind you. Uh, Witten's paper is written at a much higher level. And then you can find another higher level description of all of this in the book by Atia, Geometry and Topology of Knots. This is the lowest possible level, maybe, uh, of dealing with this. Um, uh, and um, and it's interesting to, to read Witten's higher level descriptions of how this works and how it should be related to conformal field theory and other things and so on. But we're staying at this level and we have this double insertion of Lie algebra into the loop like that. But it is the double insertion of Lie algebra into the loop that's the clue for the relationship with the Cilliaf invariants. And we'll get to that in a moment. So this is things I just said. So if you now import the Vasiliev idea, the Vasiliev idea is the following. Um, Vasiliev was thinking about knot invariance by thinking about the space of all embeddings of knots, and then augment that space of embeddings of all, all embeddings of knots with singular embeddings as well. So there would be these walls between all of the knots that have the type of the trefoil knot and all of the knots that have the type of the trivial knot, where at the wall, there's one singular verte one singular node, and then you're off switching it into a trivial knot or into another knot. And you could think of assigning not only invariance of knots, but invariance of these singularized knots, and then consider the system of invariance of singularized knots in relation to the invariance of knots. And, and you can do that um, independent of whether you're doing things like what we've been doing by simply defining the invariant. If you had an invariant of a knot, um, uh, then you could take the difference between that invariant and its switch and define the invariant of the graph to be that. Um, and uh, then you'll find that it's an invariant of rigid vertex deformations of the graphs. But what we find here is we can think about moving that line um, until it does something funny and touches the, the, the other line and then moving it on the other side. Well, we've talked about deforming the line. You have to do another uh, bit, which I haven't talked about in along the lines that I've been talking about, of asking, well, what happens if I deform it so that it goes from not touching to touching? And at the point when it touches, the Wilson loop uh, can still be computed, but um, but it's not going to be invariant anymore. And there are going to be uh, there's going to be another dimension in the deformation that you see here that has a contribution from a volume form. I'm not doing this here. Uh, I'm just telling you the answer. But the answer is that you do get a double Lie algebra insertion. Um, and putatively, if one of them is along this line, the other will be along the other line. 
the heuristics are, are fine for that. And uh, I could, could have told it, but I didn't. I just gave you the answer. So what happens then is that you see that every time you have a node, you have a double Lie algebra insertion. And if you were to then ask, well, what will happen to these invariants if we strip them down to their basics, you would see that you ought to think about just putting in double the algebra insertions for every crossing in the knot diagram and taking the trace of just that product of matrices. And that turns out to be at the base of the Vasiliev invariance. Now, to see that, I want to stop this um, evolution of thinking about Vasiliev invariance in terms of Witten's integral and just go back to the beginning and talk about Vasiliev invariance. And we'll do that for a few minutes and call it a day, I think. So the idea, the combinatorial idea for Vasiliev invariance, which was abstracted by Berman and Lin, and, um, and then connected up with, with Witten along the lines that I'm talking about with different formalisms by Barnaton, um, goes like this. We're going to talk about um, invariance like this, all right? And we're going to say that an, of an invariant of this kind, numerically valued, is a finite type if it vanishes on diagrams with more than a certain number of nodes. So if it vanishes with more than three nodes, it's of type three. If it vanishes with more than two nodes, it's of type two, okay? Um, and, and then you can think about what will happen if you were looking at an evaluation. So for example, suppose you had a type two Vasiliev invariant, and you were going to evaluate it on this graph. Well, the switching identity says that the difference between the evaluation on this one and the evaluation where you switch that crossing at the bottom is equal to the evaluation of a three-noted singular knot. But that vanishes because this was a type two invariant. So you see that at the level of k nodes, a type k invariant will only be a function of the graph and not its embedding. Therefore, it behooves us to diagram the graph in some way so we can see it better. And that's the purpose of the chord diagram for the graph. So I'm drawing a chord diagram for the nodes and not for their classical crossings. So I'm going one, two, one, two, drawing a chord diagram like that. And some combinatorial evaluation of this chord diagram is going to be the evaluation of the Vasiliev invariant for this guy for a type two. That's the philosophy. And, and you see that if you now went back to this idea of inserting Lie algebra at the crossing, it would mean that you inserted Lie algebra here at one, then you met two, a Lie algebra element, then you met one, then you met two, and now you're back to one. You're supposed to take a trace and you take the trace of those products and you sum it over all the indexes that are available for these lines, because these lines became the indexes on the Lie algebra, TA and TA. So, so you see that there's an algorithm here coming from Witten that suggests that you ought to be evaluating the chord diagrams like that. How does that come out of elementary topology, if it does? Well, it does, uh, and that's the remarkable thing. So we could, at this stage, forget about the story that we were telling about Witten's integral, which we'll come back to in the next lecture, and just look at Reitermeister moves and the idea of a type K invariant. So we already said that a graph with K nodes and a type K invariant, it'll be independent of the embedding. And I remarked on that. Oh, yeah. Um, I forgot to remark that the K, the coupling constant in Witten's integral, uh, turns out to be 1 over K by our calculation. Do you remember? I guess I should bring it back. 
we did get a one over K. You see that one of the difference was one over K one over the coupling constant. So you can imagine expanding in powers of one over the coupling constant. And then you're going to be picking up the sleeve invariance for the coefficients of one over K to the N. That's um, advertising further on, but now we're doing elementary combinatorial topology. Um, maybe this argument is due to Ted Stanford. Uh, perhaps somebody can remind me, uh, but it's a beautiful argument. I have a node. I have a little loop which goes underneath the node, and I have also drawn it as going above the node. And as far as evaluating any topological invariants, those are equivalent, equal. So when I write the diagram, I mean the evaluation of the invariant. They're equal. But I can also get from top to bottom or from bottom to top by switching. So I switch this crossing, and I get a node. Then I take the one on the right, and I write it again, uh, switched. And I switch the next one, and I get a node, and I switch the next one, and so on. Eventually, I come to <clears throat> fully switched up and add them all up on the left, and they add to zero. And on the right, I get a sum of evaluations of the Vassili of invariance for these two noted graphs, or k plus two noted graphs for some k. Um, and, and this has to add to zero. So that's called the embedded four-term relation. If we were at the top row, the place where K nodes and type K, we could forget about the embedding and write in chord diagrams. So I've written in the language of chord diagrams. I have three edge, three local edges, one, two, three. And um, <clears throat> you see one of them has two nodes in it. So that's this edge. And this guy here that goes around could be the guy on the left. And the guy that goes straight over to the right is the guy on the right. And these two nodes are in that order along this line. This one over here, two steps over, they're in the opposite order with a negative sign. They got switched. And I put the other two on the other side. And they also consist of lines next to one another and switch. So you see that that's the four-term relation in its most abstract form, just on chord diagrams. And of course, that leads people to classify chord diagrams up to this relation. But if you now went back to Lie algebra, um, you see that multiplying the two matrices in one order minus multiplying it in the other, it's a Lie algebra, it's closed under under commutators, and so there will be some constant, structure constant sum over elements in the Lie algebra, and we can write a diagram like that. <coughs> this diagram is usually called the Jacobi identity, and it is the Jacobi identity for the abstract Lie algebra from a slightly different point of view, but think of it in terms of matrices. So this says that if we multiply the two matrices, and subtract the result of switching their order of multiplication, we can put in a trivalent vertex, which indicates how to rewrite that in terms of matrices. So if you now took that and put it into a networked context, like the chord diagrams, you have that the left-hand side of the four-term relation is equal to the structure constant insertion, and then if the structure constant was so lucky as to be invariant under cyclic permutation, we could push it over here. That can be accomplished by adding the killing form in the right way or by choosing some situation where this really is symmetric. Can be done. It can be done so that this looks topological. And then you open it back up. And you see that the fourth term relation is a property of putting the matrices into the into the line in that way and taking the trace of the sum. So, so the four-term relation really is a footprint of a Lie algebra, even though if you had started in this abstract, not theorist way, it would never have occurred to you that you were supposed to get Lie algebra out the other end of this. But by the time you got down to the... Um, the the diagrams at the k level for a kth invariant and the relations that are needed there 
inside of that, it really is the Jacobi identity. It really is the footprint of a Lie algebra. And so one could start the way I just started and build a theory of, of invariance based on Lie algebras. But you wouldn't know how to evaluate the invariance from here. You would need to try to figure out how to get back to the invariant from the evaluation of these uh, K-noted diagrams. And Witten's integral gives you an answer or gives you the hint of an answer. Integrate according to his prescription this kind of data, and you'll get invariance. But one wants to have a definition that would be independent of that. And then in the history of this comes Kontsevich, who writes down an integral. Uh, there's what I meant by the evaluation using the Lie algebra. I was saying it in the air. And plug the matrices in, take the trace of the sum of the products of the matrices in that pattern. Um, I could say something about the Jacobi identity in the abstract, but let me just push over to there. There we are. Um, so Konsevich comes along, and then I think Drawer wrote a paper explaining about Konsevich's integral. Maybe that's where it first appears to us topologists. Maybe Kontsevich wrote something else. I'm not sure. But the integral, the, you put the knot diagram into this prescription. You put the knot diagram into vertical Morse type form. Um, and you have all the chords in the diagram horizontal and they live in complex planes. And you integrate. Um, you integrate forms dzi minus dzi prime over zi minus Z pri zi prime for points in the complex plane where the endpoints, the chords are in the complex plane. And you insert the Lie algebra appropriately. That's this symbol. You, um, uh, you then find that you can produce um, rigorous, perfectly rigorous, ordinary integrals that give rive to the Vassiliev invariance from uh, the weight systems described in terms of the Lie algebra, or described more abstractly, if you like. And Konsevich gave this integral, um, and it turns out that this integral, these integrals are coming out of the perturbation expansion of Witten's integral. And that's talk number two. And this is where I should stop. Oh, thanks, Lou. Um, that was um, very interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I followed all of it, but I will go delve into it, I think. Well, right. I'm not sure I followed all of it either. I think that uh, there's a, a, it's kind of amazing that, that that stuff fits together the way it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to the next talk. Um, but, well, we've got Eric... Um, talking next week sure when, whenever you care whenever. To. okay so but anyway it'll give us time to study the um the notes in more detail are there any questions uh, may i ask a question rather not question well maybe question um uh, it seems to me that kansevich wrote his integral uh directly generalizing the approach of Toshitaki Kona and Kona. And the Kinesnik Samolajnikov connection, yeah. 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 Right. This so it may be that he wasn't thinking about the the perturbation expansion of the wind. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question which I wanted is that probably the Witten's integral is somehow related to this uh Knizhnik Zamalochikov and Kona's uh holonomy formulas for the holonomy in that. And if there is a, such a connection, that probably would give you what you want. Oh, yeah, that's uh, true. And and that's by way of conformal field theory. Yeah. I think maybe explained to some degree by Kono uh, in his writing. Yeah. I'm not sure where. I have I'm to look in the sure literature. Either. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you are aware of, of this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Try to be. Yeah. Okay. Lou, one very minor question. 
it's when you wrote down an equation that you said was Jacobi, it looked more like just the definition of the bracket. Then, uh, all right, let me let me go back a moment and I'll explain. Uh, I was I wanted to stay with the oh what happened? Did I share a screen? You need to share a screen. Then. There I am. All right. Uh, let me just slide back to the here is the Jacobi identity uh, done in abstract algebra. I, I my diagrams now take a slightly different flavor. A B and A times B is the Lie product. Okay. This could be commutator, but um, it's just the Lie algebra, okay? This is the Lie product, non-associative. And it has the property that if you take BA, you get minus A times B. And now let's look at what these diagrams do. This is A times B times C associated that way. This is A times C times B. And this one is A times B times C. So this, this diagram asserts that A times B times C minus A times C times B equals A times B times C. And this negative sign can be reversed by using the anti-commutativity. And you have A times B times C is equal to uh, A times B times C plus B times A times C. In other words, left left Lie product is a derivation on the Lie algebra, okay? And that is that is the Jacobi identity. That's the definition of a Lie algebra, that it satisfies uh, anti-commutativity and the Jacobi identity. Um, so it might look a little mysterious that this is exactly the pattern of, um, of, uh, of the structure constants, but... Um, but that's because the left, the left regular representation of the Lie algebra is taking the Jacobi identity in the abstract over to the, to the matrix identity. Fine. Does, that, does that answer your question? Very much so. Thank you, yeah. Luz. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so well, thanks again, Lou, and we look okay. forward to the next talk. Uh, but next week, it, it's Eric uh, Ravel who's going to talk about the Yang-Baxter equation. Great. And uh, are are you and I and Sam meeting in an hour? If you like. And yeah. Stevie, yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll stop recording now and um, look forward to seeing you all next week.